Welcome to the Online Course Masters Show, where you'll learn how to create and sell your very own online courses. I'm your host, Phil Ebener, and alongside me is Jeremy Deegan, and we're excited to dive into a great topic today, perfectionism, something that probably a lot of people listening struggle with. While you're listening, make sure you hit that subscribe button and take a moment to leave a review wherever you're listening to the show. We really appreciate that, and it does help us to grow the show so more people can learn how to create online courses. Jeremy, how's it going? Hey, how's it going, man? Uh, I'm doing good and looking forward to this episode. I, I'm just going to say it. This is a funny thing because this episode is all about perfectionism and mostly the the cons of being perfect. And we just had a little hiccup in recording this episode. And so we're starting from scratch, which is part of our own uh, dealing with perfectionism ourselves. <laughs> so even though we're going to talk about ways to overcome perfectionism, why maybe perfectionism can be a little bit good, but also mostly why it's bad. I think it's something that everyone struggles with, even even us right right now. So to start off, I'm going to put you on the spot as someone who I would say struggles with perfectionism. Why mm-hmm. do you want to, why is it that you want to be perfect? Um, well, a lot of it just has probably to do with the ego, just making sure that I look good in front of people. If we got to the root cause, I'll just put that out there. That's probably just I want to look good. But uh, really, you know, it comes from my background, making sure that I do the job right. I do it to 100 percent. And I've also found uh, through my experiences that cutting corners can really cost you in the long run, Mm. uh, time and money. And so I, I spend a lot of time making sure every little detail is correct so I don't have to go back and do anything. But that can also hinder me because I end up taking too much time. And where I worry about a lot of things, most people probably aren't even going to notice anyways. Uh, even doing uh, a video or a course, you know, I can spend hours just making sure the lighting is perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, when there's people out there who's making a ton of money and their videos I look at and I'm like, really? Like, like- yeah, they're <laughs> shooting with an iPhone in their car in the middle of traffic and uh, they're doing yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, you know, it's... um. It, it, it's a balancing act of finding, you know, where where do you have good quality, uh, where do you not sacrifice good quality, but also where you're producing because that's really what you want to do. You want to get it out there for the world to see. And I think that's the main thing is that if perf- being perfect is holding you back from just getting your content out there, that's when it becomes a problem. Whether it's an online course, a YouTube t- tutorial, a, a blog article a podcast, whatever it is, I think the most important thing is to get your content out there. And to be honest, your audience is going to forgive a lot of things um, in terms of the quality of, of your content. And when it comes to being perfect, I guess what I'm wondering, and I want you to think about this, is when is perfectionism good or what sh- what are the things that you should try to be most perfect about? And for me, I think the actual content itself is something that I try to be perfect in, in terms of like, what am I actually saying in my course? Because at the end of the day, people can forgive me for the quality of video, for the lack of amazing effects and graphics and things like that. But if what I'm actually teaching and what I'm saying is either just kind of fluff and I'm not really diving deep into a topic, or if I'm going too long and I'm being drawn out. I think that's kind of the, the the time when trying to be more perfect with what the content is is important. And I would say in terms of equipment for video and, or for online courses, audio is probably the most important for trying to be as perfect as possible just because it's so important uh, and people can really be turned off by bad audio if they're listening to an online course or a, or a podcast or anything. But then again, I don't know. It's like then it's like how perfect do you have to be? I just don't <laughs> yeah. Know. And and I w- I want to talk about the the audio thing in a minute because that's a very interesting point. But uh, to your question, I would agree that coming up with how you're going to serve your audience and the best way to serve them is probably something that you should spend the most time on because it's really about helping others. So, uh, you know, really driving down who you're helping and why you want to help them and how you're going to help them is 
should take precedence over how does the lighting look? Uh, is this the right color lower thirds graphics or, you know, <laughs> anything of that nature? Um, let's talk about uh, equipment for a second because you brought up the audio thing and that's something that's, you know, it, it's a pretty known fact and it interests me a lot is if you have an online course, which we're talking about, you're going to have typically video and then you're going to have audio and you might have slides. So your slides can look pretty crappy. The video can look grainy, but people really start to cringe when the audio is not there. Why do you think that is? I mean, I think it's because probably a lot of people are not paying full attention to the video itself when they're watching an online course. I bet a lot of people are watching that online course in a separate tab. It might be in a tab or a window that's behind an article they're reading, or maybe they're playing it on their laptop or tablet while they're making dinner or, or washing dishes or something like that. And so if the video is bad, they might not be paying that much attention to it. But the audio is really where they're engaging with you, where they're actually getting that information primarily. And so if, if, it's, if you can't hear you talking or if the quality is bad, there's a lot of background noise that can get really annoying really fast. And I think this goes for YouTube or online courses. I know as a viewer, if I'm watching something and it's hard to listen, it I'll turn off the video. Um, and I'll, But like with video, for most people, it doesn't matter if it's a webcam. I think we're both using the Logitech C920 webcam Sorry. right now. And that so if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see that, which I would say is one of the better webcams. But we could be recording with our just internal webcam or we could step it up and be recording with a professional camera and trying to edit everything together. But I think that brings up kind of the next sort of idea is that where perfectionism is bad is it not only prevents you from maybe actually putting out content itself, but it takes so much longer to put together content. I'm just thinking like, yeah, we could both be recording this video or this podcast with a separate camera, but then the amount of time it would take to set up that camera to make sure it looks good, the file sizes are going to be a lot larger. You're going to have to send me that file size file right. online. I'm going to have to download it. I'm going to have to edit together with this audio. It's just take makes the process so much longer when at the end of the day is it going to make listeners and viewers of this podcast enjoy it anymore probably not i would say maybe like one person out there would really appreciate it um but ha are there times where you've kind of been able to overcome using specific equipment to be able to just get content out there or well yeah. i think that in the beginning it seemed like it was easier mm -hmm. um Hmm. When I first learned about online courses and I learned about uh, Udemy, for instance, um, I just wanted to get a course out there because I wanted to see what it was like, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I just popped on. I was using Canva at the time. I downloaded the cheap $10, $15 screencast software, and I just started recording. Just go, you know. Now, I did buy a microphone because – I come from a Navy background, so I do know that, you know, audio is, is pretty important in that, those aspects. So I got the uh, the one I'm using here, the ATR2100 USB. It's a dynamic microphone, and it works great, sounds great. It's USB. So it was easy to hook up. I didn't have to worry about a mixer or any of that stuff. Uh, I got my screencast software up, and I produced a course, and I started gaining students. I started having uh, a reach, and I started making money. I feel like as time goes on, I get a lot more nitpicky about stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and like we've talked about, it's it's OK to do that because you want to make better and better stuff. It's just naturally the progression. You start off and, you, you know, it's not so great and you buy better equipment mm -hmm. and you upgrade and you get a mixer and you get, you know, I went from the the Home Depot light, you know, to yeah. the LED lights that we have now. Yeah. So, you know, you naturally just want to make everything better and better. But. It, it takes longer, you know, longer to set up the lights, longer to set up the mixer and the microphone. Uh, so it does start cutting in that time and it is just finding that balance. And I think um, like with the equipment too, it's not even just the setting up equipment. I bet a lot of the listeners struggle with choosing the equipment and spending so much time 
trying to research what the best microphone is, what the best tool is to do the job when <laughs> most technology nowadays is pretty awesome. And we live in a time where pretty much any camera, webcam, any USB microphone that is over like $25 is going to be pretty good. It's funny that we mentioned this though, because I feel like I put out a lot of content, but then there are times when I am a perfectionist. For the past two weeks, I would say, the, like every single day after I work, I and while I work probably too, I'm researching cam- cameras because I want to get a new <laughs> photography camera for when my wife has our babies, our twins in mm-hmm. August, which is, uh, who knows by the time you're listening to this, but that's a few, five months away or so, four or five months. Um, and so I'm want to get a new camera, but I am spending so much time comparing like two different models when at the end of the day, it honestly doesn't matter. I mean, I teach a photography course about the whole premise is it doesn't matter what camera you need. <laughs> right, you can yeah. take great photos with any camera from the phone in your pocket to the $10,000 camera. So why am I struggling with trying to be perfect thinking that this piece of technology is going to make my photography better? And I think that's what it comes down to. People thinking yeah. the technology is going to make the the course better when that's that's not necessarily the case. It might make it look better, but the content itself itself is I think the most important part. Right, so. yeah, it goes it goes back to the content. What what you're actually teaching or helping someone with is is a more important thing here. And and I chuckle because you're talking about the cameras and I just went through this with these new LED lights I got. Um, I had the old CFL bulbs before and I switched them out and wanted to get some LED panels. And I literally made a spreadsheet that I could send you right now that's got <laughs> just about every brand and yeah. model of LED light. I think I even like text you a couple of times and was like, mm-hmm. hey, which one do you got? Why do you like it? Mm-hmm. And you know, and and I'm looking at all the specifications. This one has a CRI rating of 96 plus while the only other one has a 94. And it's like, is anyone going to look at my videos and say, hey, your CRI rating is a little <laughs> low, you know, could you could you buy a better light? No, no one cares about that stuff. So, um, it, you know, it really does not matter in the long run. Like you said, you want to make sure that it looks decent, that it sounds good. You know, audio quality is a pretty good one. And when we talk about courses, something I wanted to mention is um, when you create a course in the beginning, kind of like I did, I always tell people just create something and get it out there mm-hmm. and then you can make it, you know, you can, you can make it better later on. Um, like you said, people get, uh, uh, paralysis by analysis. They get so engulfed in the perfect screencast software, the right camera, the right lights, the right microphone. I say, just use what you have mm-hmm. and, and make something and then go through the process and see what that process is like and figure out later on what you want to make better, mm-hmm. but don't get so wrapped up in the details, which I tend to do. All yeah. The time. yeah. <laughs> I think, I think that if it's like the one answer to how to overcome it, is I guess unfortunately our answer is like you just have to do it but the easiest way to do it is to create that short sort of minimum viable product MVP course and I guess my pitch to you listening on why you should really do that is because when you're starting out a couple things first your course is probably not going to be that great compared to courses that you will create in the future I look back and you mentioned this I look back at my first course. I even look back at courses I made a year ago and I'm like, I cringe because I'm like, man, that's <laughs> just not that good. Why didn't I like, and sometimes I'm like, why didn't I spend more time like fixing the lights and stuff? But really at the end of the day, it's like, I look back and the content has gotten a lot better. The way I teach is a lot better. So that's one thing is like, your first course just isn't going to be that good. So just get it out there. And for people who don't have a brand, you need to start building that brand and that audience of your own. And even with this course that I'm saying is not that good, it's still going to be a course that you can give to people, you could sell to people, and people are going to start uh, liking you. And when I say not good, I mean that the quality might not be as good as future courses because you can invest in, in your in your equipment and get better over time and learn that process, learn how to create a course, learn how to outline it, learn how to uh, sell it. 
And so when you do have the better equipment, you can spend more time on making a better, more perfect course, and it will be more valuable at the end, and you can sell it better than your first course anyways uh, when you don't have an audience. So that's kind of like my pitch is just to get something out there. At, at the minimum, you need a microphone, like a USB microphone, the, the ATR2100. I don't know what that goes for now on like Amazon, like oh, 50, 70 bucks or something. Yeah, between 50 and 70 bucks, yeah. I mean, that's literally... The only thing you need to pay for, except That's for nothing. if you <laughs> if you if you don't have a laptop or a computer, you need one of those. But you can use free software to and free tools mm-hmm. to do pretty much anything else, from the video editing to the recording of it, creating slides. So that's like really like the minimum that you would need to do it. Um, is there anything else that you're kind of struggling well, with when it comes to putting out content or course courses or yeah, like content outside of courses? Well, I just wanted to ask you real quick. You made me think about something. You know, you talk about older courses, mm-hmm. and I wanted to ask you because I know this happens to me all the time. I still get great reviews on my first courses. Yeah. And people are like, I loved his explanations. I loved the way he taught. They're not complaining about the quality. I mean, you've been on Udemy for years longer than I have. Do you still see that in your older courses? Like, that you you see it's bad, but other people are still like, this is still good content. Yeah, and that's the total truth is that I'm saying, oh, I look back at my old courses and think, wow, why why did I do that? But it still gets good reviews. It's still making money consistently. And I'm the only person that's thinking, well, I need to update this course and make it better. Of course, there are some times where a course is old or outdated, or maybe there are bad reviews, or there's a specific part like, Sometimes I am trying to get courses out too quick that I do make mistakes. And like I'll like literally just this past week, someone messaged me and was like, hey, your lesson number 66 and lesson number 67 are the same. And I had actually like forgot I had exported two different lessons, but I had forgotten to like (laughs) change where I was exporting. And so like that was the first person since August, who even knew that, noticed that, which goes to show that not that many people get to lesson <laughs> right. 66 of classes. Uh, but it was like one of those things where, well, it hurts me a little bit now, like in the sense that, yeah, I got to go back and fix that. But it didn't hurt me for seven or eight months while that class was out there and people were enjoying the class. So it was better for me to just kind of get it out there than to... I mean, of course, of course, I would have wished it was perfect in the beginning, right. but, but well, that if, goes, yeah, that goes back to the power of having an online course, right? Is the, it's a digital product that you can change. Mm, uh, yeah. if that was a, a book, you know, uh, say 30 years ago and you had some major typo in the middle of your book, well, that book just got <laughs> printed and sent out, you know, everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so this is something that, that can be changed. You can go back and make older courses better. If you look at your video, um, I know even even our course, and this is a great example, our Photoshop course we did together, I really don't like the way that I recorded uh, the talking head videos in that course. Um, I felt like it could have been better. I could have probably taken more time. People love that course. We mm-hmm. get great reviews on that course all the time. But now I now that I got nicer, you know, nicer lights and a new camera and stuff, I can go back and re-record those if I wanted to. Yeah. I think for me, the things that I would say help me to be more consistent with putting out content is to set up a system to to make it as easy as possible. Like setting up your desk with lights around you in an office, if this is possible, so that you can just go in and start recording. Uh, once you kind of have a feel for like the different tools that you use, I, I have ScreenFlow. I use ScreenFlow to do my screen recordings. And so that's just what I use. And that's what I edit with. And so I'm no longer sort of switching between different things for most mm-hmm. of my courses, my screencast courses. And just having it all set up. I mean, my desk right now, I've got my microphone set up. I've got my audio interface plugged in. Everything's all ready to go whenever I kind of want to get going. And I've set it up to a place where I'm I'm happy with it right now. I'm happy with the quality. Mm-hmm. And yes, I could make it better if I wanted to and spend more time. Uh, and maybe like sometimes like not filming in front of like a white wall would be better. <laughs> I could go, you know, and this is the perfect example. 
I, I know I'm kind of going on a tangent, but <laughs> photography masterclass 1.0, best selling class of mine. My buddy Sam and I, I was living up in Berkeley at the time and we shot it over like, a, I don't know, three or four weeks. And we were driving all over town to get different shots just to be in different locations because I was thinking, man, that it'd be cool like if we were teaching this class like from all over the place, like with mountains in the background, with water in the background, with forests in the background. And so it took us a lot of time to actually just go to these different places and set up. And then like after we edited, uh, edited the whole course together, we sat back and we realized we really could have just done this like in a backyard and like just pan the camera around to like different backgrounds. And it would have been like the exact same quality because even mm -hmm. though we were like standing in like this beautiful forest, people couldn't really tell. We could tell while we were there, but people can't really tell if that was a forest that took us an hour to drive to or like just our backyard. And so this time when we are doing the new photography masterclass, we kept having those ideas like, oh, we should go like with the Hollywood sign behind us and, <laughs> right. and drive around and do all this stuff. But at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? This happened to us last time. And what I learned was like, let's make it easier on us so that we mm -hmm. can get this course done and out. And so we just shot most of it in my garage, in my backyard. And I think the quality is, is even better than our first class. So it reminds me of uh, those pictures. People are going to hobby stores right now. Uh -huh. And the, the, they're taking photographs of people with the flowers behind them. Uh -huh. So they'll have you seen those? No, no. <laughs> they go to a hobby store and they go to the flower section. And they actually have like the model like stand up against the flowers. And they're taking these amazing pictures. And you would never know that it's like in a hobby store. <laughs> you, think, you would think it's like out in the wilderness somewhere. That is funny. That's funny. Um, so, you know, that brings up a good point. Um, I know that you've got quite a few courses. How many courses are you up to now? It was like I mean, 80 last time I checked. Yeah. And okay, it's 80, but we got to remember that this isn't just me. I, I co-instruct a right, lot of courses. Right, right. So, but yes, but, on you but I know over 80. That, I know that you produce pretty consistently. I mean, mm -hmm. at least a course a month, if not sometimes two or three, because, because I, you know, I'm subscribed up to your newsletters and stuff. So I see them come in when, yeah. when they pop up. Um, so you, you produce pretty consistently and on a constant basis and your courses are really good quality. You know, like, of course, as you have practice and doing things like you're talking about, always having the same setup or, uh, something I do on my camera is I write down the settings because mm -hmm. I know that, um, my lights and my camera settings are always going to be the same. Now, if I go use my camera somewhere and then I come back to my office, I can just dial in those settings right away. I don't even have to readjust. I just mm -hmm. know that they're supposed to be there. So, you know, through experience and practice, I know that it helps. But where do you find that? How do you produce constantly and consistently, um, but not get too carried away in the details, but still maintain that quality? Because, you know, that's something I wanted to ask you that you seem to be pretty good at. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's a good question. It's kind of... There's a lot of things that I think I am uh, I benefit from, and it's maybe different than someone who's starting out. I think like you know we're talking about equipment not mattering as much, but I have like nicer equipment that I have just set up now in my garage, which is my studio and my my office. So it's all always set up. Um, I think like in terms of things like creating a lot of courses. I stick to a pretty similar structure when it comes to like the course promotion and the course intro video. And so while I don't script a lot of my courses, like my intro videos are basically the same across many of my courses. And so it's after doing 70 courses, it's pretty easy for me to get in front of a camera and to create to just get get there and film a promo video for a course because I know exactly kind of what to say. Um, in terms of like editing, like there's things that I think take my, make my courses look a little bit better by using actual like graphics and visual effects and sort of like temp, but I use templates. And so mm -hmm. while I teach and I use after effects, I know that it would take me a lot longer to do that, to create these sort of nice templates and openers than going to a site like videohive.net and buying a template for $10 Right. And being able to use that in all the videos or whatever. So there's like 
strategies like that that I use to kind of speed up the process. Um, I honestly think a lot of it also has to do with like be, having a background as a video editor. I think the more you edit, the faster you'll get. Um, but I studied video editing in college. So that kind of gave me a leg up on a lot of people in terms of creating content. Um, so I don't know. It's like hard for me to like think of like listening to that. I don't know if that really helps the listeners that much because <laughs> they're like, well, we can't buy that equipment. I don't have a garage that I can film in. I'm not a video editor. Um, I mean, I think there's things like the graphics that in, to make your videos look 10 times better buy a template that has like motion graphics in it for your lower thirds or for your intros and spend a half hour learning how to put those together and customize them um, yeah. with After Effects or whatever. Because that there's things like that that can really increase the quality of your course, but it's not like that much of an investment. Well, you mentioned, um, and, and I could use two examples here. Uh, you mentioned Video Hive, which is part of the Envato uh, mm -hmm. network, right? Envato yeah. Market. Um, and I use, uh, I have a Envato Elements account subscription, which allows me to go on and there's templates for everything. I mean, there's graphics and lower thirds, and I, I don't know if it has video, but it has a lot of stuff. And something I got recently was a PowerPoint slide kit because mm -hmm. I'm making a new marketing course. And, you know, you could use the template um, PowerPoints, which kind of everyone does. But for a very small fee, I was able to get this amazing uh, template for PowerPoint. It's got like 150 slides in it, like way more than I would ever use. But I could use it over and over again if need be. Mm -hmm. um, and it really cuts down a lot of that time and makes my graphics look that much better. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, when we talked about um, just kind of going back to the basics, there is another instructor uh, who's a buddy of ours that I really like the way that he does stuff. Now, all of his courses look pretty much the same. It's the same slides, and he takes a talking head video, and he sticks it in the slide, and he has his bullet points, and it's, you know, it's not very graphically intense, um, and he's able to produce often – but again, it goes back to the content. I like watching his stuff mm -hmm. because he's very knowledgeable. He knows what he's talking about and he's able to really dive deep into oh. the details of whatever he's teaching. And I think that is really the crux of everything is that it goes back to the content and what you're teaching uh, that really makes that difference. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Are you talking about uh, David Spino? No, Dave does it. I was actually, <laughs> when I was talking about it, I was thinking of John. Uh, John oh, Paul. Yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah. John John Colley has uh, the same kind of template setup. I haven't seen uh, one of his courses in recently, but I I have a couple of his in the past, and he just sticks his talking head video. It still looks professional. He has his bullet points, and and I think it's a, a smart move. Yeah, I think um, John. So you, I was gonna say I think John and and David Spino. Shout out to them. They are great examples of people that have stuck to like kind of like one style and they just put out a lot of courses. I think another thing that I was thinking about what about why I put out a lot of courses or how I can put out a lot of courses is that I really have like figured out that the courses are really where the money is and it's what's going to grow my business the most. And so I've stopped sort of experimenting a lot with webinars and premium pro products except for the online course masters member uh, mentorship program um but like these big time intensive sales funnels advertising if you have fun with that kind of stuff go for it have fun with it but when you're spending your time doing that you're not able to spend your time creating no new courses and i think that's what i've kind of learned and for like the past couple of years that's really why i've been been able to put out a course a month or two courses a month because that's mm -hmm. all I'm doing. And I'm doing this full time too. So, I mean, right. that's the other thing that people have to understand is that this is my full time job now and I'm spending 30 to 40 hours a week specifically on online courses. And even though I still do freelance video editing and video work on the side, the percentage of that has gone down. Whereas before I was working full time doing online courses on the side, then I was probably doing 50, 50 freelance work, 50% online courses. Now it's 90 plus percent of actually teaching online classes. So just having that extra time is, is obviously a blessing and a reason why I can put out so much content. So 
yeah yeah it and you know it goes back um to to just having that good content you talked about being able to do this full time we know a lot of people can't do that um but you still can get a lot done in the time that you have um and i just want to talk about maybe some steps that people can take away from this episode to kind of fight that perfectionism um yeah. to help get them moved along especially when you're in the beginning because i feel like you know us who's a, a, been doing it a little longer, a little more established, you know, we talk about Dave and John, you know, we have a system, we have a process, but the people at the beginning, I think, can really get trapped into perfectionism and do I buy the nice graphics and spend the time doing mm -hmm. that? Uh, do I just make something and run with it? So let's, let's give some takeaways for this episode, yeah. uh, maybe some steps that people can follow whenever they are creating an online course for the first time. Uh, one we talked about already was having a system. Um, developing, as you create your first or second course, writing down some things and having a system that you can refer back to so it's you know typically the same thing and make it faster. Can you record your video settings uh, on your camera? Can you um, maybe uh, write down or or have a pre-saved template of your own, uh, you know, an audition or whatever mm -hmm. audio program that you use that always gives you the same sound, so you don't have to go there and refigure that stuff back mm -hmm. out. So I think having a system uh, would be one thing. Is there things that you can document so when you make future courses, it helps speed that up? Is there any other uh, advice that you could give on combating that perfectionism? Yeah, one thing that I know you were writing down was about having deadlines and this is something we didn't talk about but to having deadlines and sticking to a schedule so having a deadline for like a bigger project like a course saying you're going to get this course done by the end of the month and writing that down because that helps for me putting it on your calendar that helps that is probably the one of the most important things to actually getting something done because otherwise you can just go on and on and on without getting anything done. And I know like for our photography masterclass 2.0 that I'm creating, we're getting that done in April. And I've been editing nonstop for the past two weeks. And it's going to take me another few weeks to, to get that one done. But hey, we're going to get it done and we're going to get it out in April because that's the deadline that we've set. And so that's kind of for bigger projects, but also for other types of content, maybe whether it's a podcast or a YouTube series, having a consistent schedule so mm -hmm. that and sticking to it and knowing that, okay, I'm going to put out a weekly podcast episode no matter what. And so that I got to force myself to come up with that idea or to record it or for like a YouTube video. I'm just going to go live on YouTube every week at the same time. And it just kind of forces you to create that content to come up with ideas, um, which I think in turn also helps you grow your audience faster because they love that, that kind of consistency. Right. So yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think ahead. the deadline is a, is a big one. And I wanted to mention real quick, um, challenges. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're not talking about if you're self hosting on, um, I don't, I don't think any thinkific or teachable does anything like this, but I do know for a fact that Udemy and Skillshare have challenges often and they will give prizes away or they'll help market or promote your course. Mm -hmm. Those have been really beneficial for me because, uh, even if I don't win, it helps give a little extra drive of trying to get something done. So Skillshare will say, uh, create a photography course this month mm -hmm. and have a chance to win a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. And just, just that little extra bonus helps get me in the mindset of, okay, I want to have this done just to have that chance to win. So if you can, uh, sign up for a challenge like that, or even give yourself a challenge, maybe talk to a friend and get them involved and say, Hey, I need help finishing this. Uh, can we, set something up where if I do finish it, uh, you know, we go out to lunch or whatever. I don't know, yeah, but yeah. I think challenges can, can really help, um, combat that too. Yeah. I like that idea. And I think I mean, we're kind of getting a, a little bit away from perfectionism and just talking about how to get consistent content out. But one other idea along with that is just batch processing, batch recording content. That's what we're doing right now with this podcast. Uh, we're recording a lot of episodes so that when we launch, we have weekly episodes that will last for a few months so that if we don't have a chance to record new episodes, we still have consistent content coming out. And that just makes 
my life easier. And I think that's Mm -hmm. why, honestly, the, I had a long pause. One of the reasons why I had a long pause between season one and season two of this podcast was that I had batch processed and recorded a lot of episodes, probably like at the very beginning and then up until like August of 2017. But then I ran out of episodes at the end of the year but the end of the year is so crazy with the holidays and then the new year starts and I have all these other projects and then, hey, my wife's pregnant with twins. And so there's all these things that kind of come come about. And so having that sort of batch of content that I can release slowly really, really does help with the consistency as well, rather than trying to record, edit, release every single week. Yeah. And you can get stuck in that rut because you record one, say for a course, you record a lecture and then you edit it. And you're so concerned about that one episode that you you want to cut out all the ums and ands and all the things. And and in regards to this podcast, you know, you and I had some ideas that we we put down. We put down some couple bullet points, but we're not going in and scripting each episode, Mm -hmm. recording each episode, editing each episode. We said, hey, let's just write down some bullet points. We'll go through, you know, 10, 20 episodes at a time and we'll batch process those out. I think when you batch process, it does help with the perfectionism because you're looking at it more of a whole Mm -hmm. instead of like on an individual basis. And that's Mm -hmm. the same thing with the courses. If I'm looking at my course as a whole of 100 lectures or 50 lectures or 20 lectures instead of like an individual lecture process, I think it really helps out. Um, And I've definitely been in that rut before where you record an episode or you record a lecture or a video and you want to edit it and you are so like you spend two days editing that one video and then you look up and you're like, wow, I got 99 more videos I got to make. Like, yeah. it's very daunting, you know? Yeah. Man, well, a lot of good stuff about perfectionism. Hopefully people listening can relate to us and also can learn from some of our advice about how you can overcome perfectionism. Uh, basically, just coming up with a process, batching, having a system, setting deadlines. I love the idea about having challenges to get stuff done all great ideas. So if you have any ideas yourself, we'd love to hear them. Head over to onlinecoursemasters.com, go to the Facebook page, Online Course Masters Facebook page, or actually the group. Share your thoughts, share um, any questions you have, or if you have any ideas yourself for how you, you overcome perfectionism, we'd love to hear them over there. So as always, make sure you hit that subscribe button if you like this episode. And if you did, please leave a review wherever you're listening to this. This that really helps us to reach more people. And it also just helps us to know that people are liking this podcast and it will encourage us to create more episodes. So thank you so much for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.